Welcome everyone to the final session of the day, the headline of the show, if you will. When the organizers approached me to moderate the final session of the day, I knew we had to end with a bang. And my first thought was that, boy, oh boy, we have some really tough acts to follow. Nothing, absolutely nothing in this world is more exciting than regulation and risk management, especially when you throw liability in there. However, as a close second, we landed on a conversation around some of the amazing things that are happening with carbon capture technology. So as Jeff said, my name is Mark Summers. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for a company called Emissions Reduction Alberta, or ERA. We are a not-for-profit funding organization based here in Alberta, and we help the government of Alberta to invest some of the tier fund dollars that are collected through the provinces made in Alberta climate regulation. So my talented and eloquent colleague, Grace Meikle, was on the stage earlier, part of session three this morning, and talked about some of the super cool things that we're doing as an organization, so I don't need to take any more time to talk about ERA. We have a fantastic panel lined up for you to close things out. I'm joined on the stage by five esteemed panelists, each of whom are involved in carbon capture technology. In fact, we have so many panelists on the stage that there's not a chair for me on the stage. I think as we all know, right now we collectively have an astonishing window of opportunity, an alignment of the stars, if you will, for CCUS in Canada and particularly in the province of Alberta. And each of these panelists are making things happen for CCUS from technology development to direct air capture to large scale mega, mega capture projects. So in a moment, I'll ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they're working on and show some visuals with their beautiful slides. Uh, but first, I just wanna let you know who's on the stage with me. Um, first, we'll start maybe not quite in visual order, but in the order I have it written down in my notes here. Um, Paul Pesteris is general manager for Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Canada, a true titan in the industry. Uh, James Martin is VP of Engineering for Advantage Energy and just as importantly, Entropy, which I can only assume, according to the laws of thermodynamics, with a company name like that, is a company that will only ever increase and can never decrease. Jeff Holmes leads regulatory engagement and public outreach efforts for carbon engineering, one of the earliest pioneers of direct air capture uh, that Spencer talked about this morning, and one of ERA's earliest investment, investments into capture technology. Uh, Chad Baudry is VP of Business Development for Svante. Again, one of the most promising non-liquid amine capture technologies in the world, period. Uh, and finally, Sanadar is Manager of Clean Technology and leads the CCUS portfolio at Alberta Innovates, our sister organization, an organization that is blazing new trails for technology and innovation in the province of Alberta. So without further ado, I'll invite each of the panelists to give us a 10 minute maximum introductory presentation. Um, at around 10 minutes, I might kind of stand beside you ominously and give you a signal that your time is about up. Uh, but everybody, please join me in welcoming Paul to the podium. Thank you, Paul. Okay, thanks, Marco. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Pasteris. I'm the general manager of uh, MHI Canada, which is actually MHI Low Carbon Solutions Canada. So pretty huge name for our, our entity. Uh, so today I'll provide you a, a very brief introduction into the company and uh, the things that were, well, a little bit of the history on carbon capture technology that we developed and uh, the things that we're actually working on right now. So without further ado, okay, so Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. So the company has actually been founded uh, 135 years ago, back in 1884. It employs over 80,000 people through over 200 companies. And um, yeah, and it's ob obviously covers a large number of business sectors worldwide. MHI sales are in excess of uh, $30 billion a year. What we cover is everything from aerospace to manufacturing of compressors. And yes, we manufacture CO2 compressors as well. Um, we manufacture gas turbines and steam turbines. And we also have the engineering division that, um, that I'm representing today. 
Um, so that engineering division does EP and EPC services for the petrochemicals industry, as well as blue hydrogen and blue ammonia markets. And that is where the carbon capture technology resides. So we license CCS technology, but we also provide full EP and EPC services for our clients. And some clients don't only want just uh, a licensor package. So we do that too. We can work with your um, preferred EP provider. Okay. So in terms of the carbon capture business uh, operation, we, we cover the globe. Uh, we're obviously headquarters in Yokohama, Japan, and um, that office houses over 900 engineers and is supported by high value centers located in the Philippines and in India. Uh, in addition to that, we have offices in London, England, and in Germany, and these offices cover both Europe and the Middle East. We have our U.S. and America's headquarters, which is based out of Houston, which is where I report into. And we have our newly minted Calgary office that opened up just recently in November of last year. Our Houston office basically supports our clients with everything from feasibility studies to uh, process design packages or licensure packages, while Japan covers uh, the full gamut from conceptual studies all the way to feed and uh, detail engineering. Next slide. Okay, so you've probably seen this before. It's a very uh, simplified version of, of a process flow diagram, but it just kind of gives you, for the people that are not familiar, just gives you an idea of what, uh, what it looks like. So the KM CDR process is based on licensed aiming technologies that we developed in conjunction with Kansai Power way back in the 1990s. Um, the solvent developed for this process is capable of capturing over 95% of the CO2 from um, post-combustion flue gas streams. It, actually, it, it goes way beyond that if, you, if, that is, uh, if there's an economic case. It does this very efficiently and with very little solvent degradation. So that's one of the advantages of our patented uh, solvent. So the configuration, as you can see, consists of a quencher, which is used to cool the flue gas. There is an absorber to chemically react the CO2 with the amine solvent. And the uh, strips, uh, flue gas is then water washed and then released to the, to the atmosphere. And then the rich amine is regenerated in a regenerator, which produces the lean solvent and a concentrated CO2 stream. So MHI has spent the last uh, three decades in developing TKS-1 solvent. Um, that's what's been used in a lot of the plants that we built. Uh, over those years, though, we've actually have made a lot of progress in developing the solvent. And last year, we commercialized KS-21, which is our new commercial offering, which provides significant amount of advantages. And that is, it provides a better thermal stability. It reduces degradation in the presence of O2, which is a major issue for these type of applications. It has lower solvent regeneration energy requirements. And it also allows us to operate the regenerator at higher pressure, which is an advantage in reducing horsepower requirements and power demand for the CO2 compressor. All right, so this is what our worldwide commercial experience looks like. We have 14 pan, uh, plants that are of commercial scale that have been built with our technology. And these range from 210 to 4,800 tons per day of CO2 capture. I believe this is around 70% of the installed capacity worldwide. So we have a, a very good uh, portfolio. We have some plants which are currently in construction as shown on the diagram. And we also have a number of projects which are in feed. That I can't even go through because there's too many of them, including a world scale project in Alberta, a real massive scale project in Alberta. Our crown jewel right now to date is Petronova, which some of you are probably familiar with. Um, this is our largest plant to date. It's located just southwest of Houston. Uh, the capacity, the facility was uh, built in 2016. The unit is designed to recover over 4,700 tons per day of CO2 from a coal-fired power plant. The CO2 recovery is used for enhanced oil recovery, which is about 80 mile, 81 miles away. So MHI as part of the consortium provided full EPC turnkey services for this facility, which included both the, um, the capture as well as the pipeline. MHI also provided pre-commissioning, operator training, 
and operations technical support. So the unit was designed back then for recovery of 90% of the CO2 in the flue gas. Actual performance was around 92.4. Uh, the carbon capture unit has been shut down because of uh, some issues with the power plant, which I can't get into, but some uh, technical issues that the power plant had, not the carbon capture plant had. Um, but it is now being uh, prepared for coming back into service. And we're supporting our client, which is uh, JX Energy or JX Oil, in bringing the unit back online. The next one, which is the, the Mammoth, which is going to be our, our new crown jewel, is Capital Power. So Capital Power right now, is currently in the construction phase of the Genesee repowering plant in near Edmonton. And Capital Power is looking at adding a carbon capture facility using our technology. So this will be, you know, a world scale. It is going to be their largest in North America. It's going to be a two train configuration, as you can see from the very, very small uh, 3D model that is shown there. Uh, but basically it's two train to match the two gas turbine trains. The capacity of this unit will be 11,500 tons per day, which is for some for whoever uses more annual rather than day, it will be over 4 million tons per annum. Um, so the work right now on the on this unit is in feed. It will be completed in in June, and uh, we're expecting FID later this year, and then an in-service date in sometime in early 2017. So in conclusion, I hope I didn't take more than my time allotted. I wanna finish with a quote that I took out of the Capital Power website. And the, the quote reads as follows. We recognize CCUS as an integral part of the long-term solution to tackle climate change globally and enable zero or near zero emissions from natural gas generation. So this is to me is a very important statement from a, an industry leader. So we do have the, the technology to, to decarbonize our assets and to meet climate targets that have been set by our government. And as MHI, we would be more than happy to help you in achieving those goals. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Paul. We'll move right along. That is truly mind-blowing scale that you're talking about in terms of projects already built and in the hopper. So thank you very much. Um, we'll turn it next over to James. Thank you. Good afternoon. As I said, I'm James Martin, Vice President of Engineering for Entropy. I think they take it as an insult if uh, if I said I was Vice President at Advantage. I'm not. I'm Vice President at Entropy. So first, I'd like to uh, introduce Entropy. And of course, I'm talking about Entropy, the company, not the other Entropy. And Entropy, the company, is a clean tech pure play focused on decarbonization. Just to get a few buzzwords out there early, we are particularly focused on post-combustion carbon capture on point sources. We have a very unique set of expertise that allows us to be highly effective in this space. And we've set the company up to add value in every part of the CCS value chain, right from constructing the contracts that we need to work with the emitters to, of course, capture technology, sequestration, and even to tracking, reporting, and uh, monetization of environmental attributes that come from CCS. We have proprietary technology, both on the chemistry of the solvent, as well as process design that allows our process to be highly efficient. And we also have capital that we're willing to put towards these projects to really make them uh, come into fruition. Now, where does that capital come from? Well, it comes from Brookfield. Uh, many of you may know, but Brookfield is a very large Canadian investor and really a true Canadian success story. And we're very proud to be part of their $15 billion energy transition fund. And as I said, this capital is meant to put towards CCS projects to get them off the ground. That makes us a partner in the long-term performance of these projects. 
It's surprising sometimes for people to learn that we're one of very few post-combustion projects really ever built, one of two in operation today, and really we're the only one capturing carbon from a natural gas point source, again, post-combustion. So we're very proud of that. This is our plant. It's been operating since July last year. It continues to operate very well, exceeds expectations on many design parameters. It's up uh, on the Advantage Glacier Gas Plant. And um, it, uh, it, so that's west of Grand Prairie in Alberta. And we hope to export that same technology all over the world along with our partners here on stage. Just a few notes on some of the particular technology that, uh, that goes with entropy. So modular carbon capture is our approach to designing and building this equipment. It's not a one size fits all solution. That's not what we mean by modular. What it is is uh, the process equipment is built in fab shops, transportable in size, and they are brought out after and bolted together. That's the modular fashion that helps us to control cost, quality, and also allows it to fit nicely on the existing footprint of the plant, which is very important considering the maintenance that these plants often, well, always require. Integrated carbon capture is our approach to incorporating the carbon capture equipment onto the emitter's platform when it's a greenfield project. So as the emitter is being fabricated, we include carbon capture technology on that so that it comes out part and parcel with the emitting equipment. Entropy 23 is really a family of high performance solvents that uh, is, as we've already heard, very important to the process in keeping the energy costs of doing carbon capture down. Entropy heat capture, is really just the expertise on knowing how to manage the heat that's on that plant. There's waste heat recovery and there are other forms of heat transfers. It's very important that you do this well to ensure that your overall process is very efficient. And again, the costs to the process are kept down. Reverse entropy storage, again, really that's just expertise on finding out where the storage aquifers are doing the MMV and all the things that come apart or come along with uh, CO2 storage in the long term. And then something new we have is Entropy IQ. So we built our plant, it's operating, and we knew right away that we needed software to track real time the performance indicators that we require to make sure that that operation is optimized. So we went ahead and built proprietary software for our own purposes. And once we had it and looked at how good it was, we realized that really this is something that everyone who's going to be doing this is going to require. And therefore we're offering this as a service unto itself. And I just like to say thank you for your attention today. Thank you very much, James. Really exciting. And next, we'll turn it over to Jeff. I'm just going to advance the slide to make sure. Yes, Jeff, go ahead. Hey, gang. Um, thanks for having me. It's, it's good to be here because uh, carbon engineering was actually founded right here on this campus um, 13 and a half years ago. Makes me feel old saying that. Um, there was a number of us looking at uh, direct air capture of CO2 uh, on an academic basis back then, under uh, then U of C professor David Keith. Um, and the more we looked at the science and the more we looked at the fundamentals of this concept, as strange as it seemed to, to many in the community at the time, the more we realized there really weren't any showstoppers. And thus the wisdom of doing carbon removal or direct air capture was going to hinge on sort of pragmatic engineering realities, not so much on scientific principles or prohibitions. Um, so we actually spun out a company to do just that. Um, maybe you've been through all this already today. If so, forgive me. If not, I just want to reset the context on where we're at. 
a couple slides and a couple graphs borrowed from the International Energy Agency and the net zero 2050 scenario that they released uh, a couple years ago. So this scenario got a whole bunch of press for claim for and the press kind of ran under the headline no new fossil fuels. So the IEA said, look, if we just produce the reserves that we've got and we try to eliminate emissions as aggressively at source as we can, what's it going to take to get to 2050? And I'll draw your attention to a couple of numbers at the bottom there. Halfway between now and 2050, we need to be capturing four gigatons of CO2. So if a reference scale plant, just to make the math simple and, and, and the discussion easy, is a megaton scale per year facility, that, that means we need to build 4,000 carbon capture plants um, in, in the intervening time. By 2050, that number is seven and a half gigatons. So seven and a half thousand plants between now and 2050. Um, similarly, they looked at how much carbon removal, so directly physically removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere for the purposes of storing it permanently was going to be required. Their scenarios actually came in kind of on the low end. The IPCC has run a number of their own and came up with much higher numbers, but the two graphs that I've starred there point out that we need gigatons of carbon dioxide removal by 2030, in addition to many gigatons of point source carbon capture. So again, this is thousands of point source carbon capture facilities at megaton reference scale and thousand or thousands of carbon removal facilities by 2050. So we shouldn't even be here talking right now. We should all be out building plants and financing projects. Um, <laughs> well, th thank you to the one person who clapped. Um, so what, what have we done at Carbon Engineering? Really what we focused on um, is engineering a technology that can extract CO2 from atmospheric air at megaton scale with economics that are viable to the climate problem. Right? We've of course captured CO2 from uh, ambient air on spaceships and submarines, but price was no object. Survival was the object. So how do you do this at large scale and with economics that are relevant to the other choices we have to decarbonize our economy? And what we came up with at Carbon Engineering was a liquid scrubbing method. So we take uh, big air contacting devices that look a lot like industrial cooling towers. And we run a strong alkaline solution through those. The alkaline solution has an affinity for CO2, so it reacts in the aqueous phase to form a carbonate. We then have a couple of chemical processing steps to get that CO2 back from the carbonate and remake the capture chemical. First, we precipitate, so we get ourselves a solid, cal a solid calcium carbonate, which is carrying the captured atmospheric CO2. And then we take it up to high temperature where it naturally decomposes into calcium oxide and gives off gas phase CO2. We do this in a circulating fluid bed uh, oxy-fired calciner. That's a fancy way of saying a really hot oven uh, that is only burning natural gas and oxygen. So if you remember your high school chemistry, your combustion takes you to CO2 and water vapor. The decomposition of the calcium carbonate leaves behind calcium oxide as a solid, gives off gas phase CO2. So in the headspace of that vessel, we have a mixed stream of the atmospheric CO2 we absorbed in the first place, the combustion CO2 from the natural gas and water vapor. We then go through gas cleanup and compression in ways that are pretty standard in this province to knock the water out, get the CO2 to pipeline spec where it can then either be used uh, to make products. That only makes sense if those products have a lower life cycle carbon intensity than what they're displacing, or we take that CO2 and we inject it underground into a suitable geology where it stays for millennia. And by so doing, create a physical flow of CO2 from air to rock. Um, so we've built a whole series of prototypes, pilots, test benches, you name it. Um, this is kind of our latest and greatest out in Squamish, British Columbia, um, where presently we're capturing a couple tons per day with this device. Um, it tests and lets our engineers gather data and do innovations on all the core uh, unit operation, the air contactor, the pellet reaction, the calciner. We have oxygen production at site. Um, and this is the facility that we're using to gather engineering data um, for the first of a kind 
facility that we're working on down in the United States. We've licensed our technology to a U.S. project developer called 1.5. They're a subsidiary of Occidental Petroleum, and they have ambitions to deploy somewhere between 70 and 130 uh, megaton scale facilities um, based on our technology between now and, and 2035. So we're into detailed engineering on the Texas facility. Um, bulldozers are moving earth and utilities are coming to site. And it's just absolutely thrilling to see something that was, you know, on a lab, lab bench and in a garage when many of us started on this, actually starting to take shape in the real world and in, you know, the, the everything's bigger in Texas energy sector they have down there. Um, We've got developers working in other countries as well. Um, all the other markets are a little more challenging than down in America, where there's this very lucrative combination of subsidies, cheap energy, great pore space, favorable climate. But our ambitions don't uh, end in America. We we would like to to promote this technology worldwide and see it um, deployed in in many different markets where it can be useful. So that's it for me. Thank you so much, Jeff. I will say you have successfully captured our attention directly out of the air. So we're going to move on. I'll turn it over to Chad. Chad next. Please join me in welcoming Chad to the podium. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be speaking with these panelists. It's nice to meet some of you and, and see you again. Uh, thank you for your attention. I was watching while they were speaking and you guys are really engaged. So you get an A plus for that. Um, so I guess, uh, Savante, we've been around for about 15 years. We've been developing this technology, uh, but it's really only been the, the last 12 to 18 months. You know, I, I don't know if you guys are catching on to this, but carbon capture is kind of a big deal right now, right? Hence all of us getting together. So I appreciate you guys being here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the company, Svante. A lot of people probably haven't heard about us. We're a small company. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our technology, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the projects we're working on right now. So I'm going to do all this within five slides and 10 minutes. So get ready for the magic act. So we're based in, in we're Calgary or Canada uh, owned and operated. Uh, we've grown uh, from about two people to just over two, 220 in, in about three or four years. Uh, last 100 people that we added were, were last year, uh, very steep growing curve. Uh, we're, we're mainly located right now out of uh, Burnaby, British Columbia, so truly Canadian. We, we've scaled our technology 300 times so far, and we've got to make that jump to a uh, fairly significant commercial scale, and that's what we're working on day and night right now. If you've been following us, you, you would have seen last December, we uh, had a pretty big jump in, in investment. Uh, we ended up um, bringing in about $320 million worth of uh, USD worth of, worth of investment. Uh, people are getting very excited about carbon capture technologies. Uh, they need an option to decarbonize their facilities. Um, we've got five units running right now. One is in Pau, France for Total. One is with our friends at Synovus, uh, probably our flagship uh, facility. It's been running since 2019. We've got one for Lafarge uh, in Richmond. Thank you for coming all this way. Uh, we've got two in California now. We've, we also make DAC filters, direct air capture filters, and we're, but we're mainly focused on point source. Um, like I said, we've been at it for about 15 years now, and our solution reaches roughly 90% of the market, all the way from GCC, NGCC, all the way up to steam methane reforming, maybe 20%. So the analogy that I'm going to start off with is it's a tsunami analogy. I've, I've talked to many of you in the room, so you might have heard it in the past, but we're all, imagine we're all sitting on the beach, we're all enjoying the sun, and the water pulls out and the birds fly away, right? Everybody stands up and says, okay, what are we, do, what are we going to do now? And that's really what's happening in carbon capture. We're trying to figure out how do we capture our CO2 and what do we do with it once we have it? And so... What I'm going to do is I'm going to share to you with you a little bit about what we're going to spend all our money on <laughs> that we just raised. So the first, the technology, it's very simple and elegant right, right around the top. Uh, we take a solid sorbent. It's uh, really centered around metal organic framework these days because of the resilience of it. 
We take that metal organic framework, we turn it into a filter, we take those filters, we put it into a rotary contactor by which that rotary contactor was finally fabricated, shipped and erected in Edmonton. So we, we have a test unit in at Kiewit's Mod Yard in, in Edmonton. And then Savante designs the process around it. So what are we gonna do to commercialize this technology? Uh, we need some options. Uh, so first we've, we've signed a long-term agreement with BASF. Uh, BASF, we've taken, actually, that's another noteworthy point is, like our friends uh, that, that spoke before us or before me, uh, our technology was developed and patented at the University of Calgary. So a lot of great things happening here and, and a lot of great minds working on this. We are, we're going to take that ingredient, those ingredients, the, the recipe, give it to BASF, and they're going to uh, manufacture this in large tonnage scale quantities for us. And then what we're doing is we're spending roughly 100 to $110 million on a world-class facility in Burnaby. That facility will produce up to 10 million tons a year of filter capacity. And so that's what we're working on right now. The, the facility, it's about 150,000 square feet. It's a, it's a construction zone. We've got Chandos and Kiwit in there. They're, they're doing their thing. That's all great. Uh, the next step is the rotary absorption machine. So like I shared, uh, the third picture to the right, uh, that's important to us because we need to have a unit that works in the field. It's here, it's now, and it's operating in, uh, in Edmonton, Alberta, which is great. Uh, the next thing that we're focused on, I think most of us on the panel are focused on on a daily basis, is getting the clients to understand the costs, the CapEx, the OpEx. How is this going to work with my system? Uh, we have to do class fives, class fours, go into a feed. You'll, you'll see a little bit about that uh, in the next slide. And the last one is really, we're a development company. We've been developing for 15 years. We're gonna to continue to do that. We're gonna to continue to make sure that our technology is competitive and it works well for you guys. So that's what we're working on right now. Um, and that's what takes most of our energy on a daily basis. Uh, so the first project, uh, Lindy, we just wrapped, wrapped up a fairly significant DOE feed um, on a steam methane reformer. It, it was you know four, over 44,000 ton per day, uh, pretty important. We're, we're literally just putting the final touches on that report to the Department of Energy, uh, which is great. Um, Suncor is, is the next one on the list. We're, we're inches. We're probably about a month away from starting a, a full-scale feed there. It's gonna be uh, taking flue gas uh, off of a uh, fluidized catalytic cracking unit, so FCCU. So that's another thing that I didn't really hear today. A lot of these technologies, if it's point source, you're gonna solve several problems. You're gonna take out the, the NOx, the SOx, the particulate, and then you're gonna take the CO2 out as well. So it's it's really quite quite a positive thing for, for these clients. Uh, and that one, it just so just so happens to be starting up in about a month. So that's great. Uh, the last one that I've chosen to show today is uh, a pilot plant that we're just we're just commissioning today, or as, as we speak, for Chevron. It's in the San Joaquin Valley, in just outside of Bakersfield, California. This one, uh, the only word I can use, if if you like pilot plants, this one's super sexy. It uh, it it can operate anywhere between NGCC three and a half four percent all the way up to twenty percent. So you can see how that interacts with that flue gas. Uh, there's people all over the world looking to see how that how that plant performs and I'm super excited to, to have that up and going. Um, so this is what it looks like, okay? It's very simple, very elegant. This is what we're gonna be producing, 10 million tons per year. So if everybody sits up or stands up and you look under your chair, Nobody did it. Oh, come on. Nobody gets a nobody gets a star. You weren't paying attention. Okay. Uh, but this is what it is. It's uh, we're going to be producing an awful lot of this. And this is what our mandate is uh, to to solve the solution to have a to have an option for carbon capture. The last slide that I have is I just wanted to to leave you with is, you know, we're we're in Alberta. We produce a lot of hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is very important to our industry. I haven't run the numbers lately, but I was I was very involved in the hydrogen uh, space for for you know probably fifteen to to twenty years. 
all of that hydrogen, most of that hydrogen is produced by steam methane reforming. And all I hear today is about ATR and we've kind of, you know, switched our focus to autothermal reforming. I think that's a fantastic technology as well. But most certainly all of the, the facilities that are built, they need to be decarbonized. And point source is the perfect solution for that. And in fact, we're working with the largest hydrogen producer in the world. Uh, they are laser focused on point source uh, CO2 capture because up to world scale steam methane reformer, um, point source capture, CO2 point source capture is, is the answer. Uh, world scale reformer is probably around, you know, 150 million standard cubic feet a day. We, we've probably got roughly, uh, you know, 1.5 billion standard cubic feet a day of production of, of hydrogen in, in, in this region. Uh, so anyways, I just want to, want to let you know, uh, steam methane reforming is still important. Don't forget about it. It's got us to where we are today. And, uh, Thank you very much for your attention. We'd love to talk to you in the future. Thank you so much, Chad. I promise you one day, all of us non-Scandinavians will learn how to pronounce Svante. Okay, finally up next, the headliner of the headline session. Um, please join me in welcoming Sanadar to the podium. So thank you so much, everyone, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So, so my name is Sana Dar, and I'm a manager at Clean Technology with Alberta Innovates. Um, so today I'll be discussing the Hydrogen Centre of Excellence and its role in CCS and clean hydrogen production. So in my work with Alberta Innovates, uh, I come to you from Edmonton, uh, where I live as a guest on the traditional Indigenous lands of Treaty 6 and Métis Nation of Alberta. So let's dive right into it. What is Alberta Innovates? So we were created by the Alberta Research and Innovation Act um, to support research and innovation activities, including those directed at the discovery, commercialization, and the application of knowledge. We serve entrepreneurs, businesses, and researchers at any point from discovery through applied testing and validation to commercialization and end use. So our work spans the full spectrum of sectors and industries from clean energy to carbon capture. In fact, 63% of Calgary-based high-tech entrepreneurs, like the ones that are right here, uh, were supported through Alberta Innovates. So Innotech Alberta is a subsidiary of Alberta Innovates. So it's leading research and technology organization, serving the needs of industry, entrepreneurs, and the public sector. So the newest addition to this asset base is the Alberta Carbon Conversion Technology Center that's right here in Calgary, which was home to the Carbon X Prize winner, Carbon Cure, and others. So C4 Technologies is a, also a subsidiary of Alberta Innovates, which provides applied engineering services and testing to advance safety, efficiency, and environmental performance in partnership with the energy industry. With hydrogen and CCUS technologies advancing as tools towards net zero, CIFR is looking at the complexities of transporting a gas, gas hydrogen mixes, hydrogen and CO2 from production to storage to market. So the Clean Technology Group uh, within Alberta Innovates addresses sustainability while create, creating opportunity for economic diversification in Alberta. Uh, we need to consider more than just achieving net zero. We need to establish a mindset and the tools to stay there. The conversation on net zero is currently focused on strategies and tools. It needs to also focus on behaviors and values. So these are the four focus areas within the clean technology group as shown on the slide. So Alberta Innovates has recently published uh, a white paper on CCUS technology, uh, which takes into account that CCUS is considered to be a key pathway for Canadian governments and industry to reach their net zero ambitions. So Alberta has invested approximately $140 million in more than 100 CCUS projects in the last 25 years. So these investments have contributed to Alberta's international le leadership and reputation in CCUS and MMV. Alberta is well positioned with enormous CO2 storage capacity, estimated to be more than 100 billion tons. Alberta is home to commercial projects and demonstrated CCUS technologies backed by years of research and op operating experience. 
So hydrogen is a critical part of Alberta's decarbonization future. Hydrogen is one of Canada's most exciting economic transformation opportunities to help businesses grow, dramatically reduce emissions in the industrial sector, and enable a new Canadian competitive advantage in a low-carbon economy. So the Hydrogen Center of Excellence that is outlined in Alberta's hydrogen strategy and is expected to deliver the research and innovation aspects to create a hydrogen economy for Alberta. The center will support technology, innovation, and hydrogen value chain to demonstrate hydrogen safety, build public awareness and confidence in hydrogen, and advance technologies across Alberta's uh, economy and across the hydrogen supply chain. So you're all probably wondering what is the Hydrogen Center of Excellence? So Alberta's hydrogen roadmap outlines our ambition, our policy pillars, and key markets and outcomes. Alberta can become a major supply of clean hydrogen. As Canada's largest hydrogen producer, we have a number of production methods available to help meet demand within Alberta and around the world. Our natural gas reserves, when combined with CCUS, provide a way to quickly scale hydrogen production. We also have the capability to produce hydrogen using renewables, electricity, or emerging technologies like natural gas decomposition. So the establishment of the Clean Hydrogen Center of Excellence supports hydrogen roadmaps, policy pillars to activate technology and innovation, as well as lead the way and build alliances. So the scope and focus of the Hydrogen Center of Excellence is public awareness. A substantial public awareness campaign uh, has been developed within the Center of Excellence to inform the public about the scope, benefits, and deployment uh, of a hydrogen economy in Alberta. The stakeholder engagement work in the development of the Hydrogen Roadmap identified the need to have incremental technology, research, and innovation as a whole in the hydrogen space to facilitate investment in a hydrogen economy. Alberta Innovates, CIFR, and Innotech are all experienced in developing innovation project partnerships. So there are three funding streams within the Hydrogen Center of Excellence. The first being the technology and innovation stream, which has $35 million of funding allocated to it. The stream focuses on technology development across the value chain for TRL three to six, includes CCUS and feed studies for commercial scale projects. Capital project stream has $10 million of funding, and this focuses on building facilities and testing capabilities at InnoTech and CIFR. And the services capacity stream has $4 million of funding. It focuses on studies, an an analysis, codes, and standards, and public awareness. And so our first round of competitions uh, closed this year for the technology and innovation stream, which focused on reducing the technology gaps uh, in production, storage, carrier, and market and use. And so 18 projects have been awarded funding for $20.1 million of contribution coming from Alberta Innovates and Natural Resources Canada. So we will be launching uh, competition number two, uh, which will be launched in 2024 in collaboration with Emissions Reduction Alberta and Natural Resources Canada to expand the program uh, to service TRL three to nine. So work is underway on the capital upgrade to laboratory and testing facilities at CIFR and InnoTech. And so our first competition is complete for the services capacity stream as well too. So the purpose of our CCUS white paper, you probably heard my colleagues speak uh, about this, Grace Mickle, um, in terms of the CCUS white paper. And so we basically ended up summarizing the learnings, the insights from 100 plus CCUS projects, both Alberta Innovates and Emissions Reduction Alberta in the past 20 plus years. So we've identified gaps and made recommendations for accelerated CCUS deployment in Alberta. So some of the key recommendations um, that have come forward is leveraging Alberta's uh, expertise in commercial scale CCS projects for high CO2 concentration facilities, conducting CCUS feed studies, and building commercial scale projects at oil sands facility and natural gas combined cycle power plants using commercial means, developing more clean tech talent and help existing clean tech companies grow. Um, You've probably seen this slide, Uh, Grace talked about it, it was the Carbon Capture Kickstart program uh, that was initiated by Emissions Reduction Alberta, and there's 11 projects that were awarded funding, 
um, that focused on carbon capture and sequestration. And so some of these uh, projects are being co-funded by Natural Resources Canada, and the program supports pre-construction design and engineering. It's focused on on-site carbon capture, direct air capture, direct carbon conversion, and strategic CO2 transportation infrastructure. And so if successful, these projects could lead over to a $20 billion in capital expenses, create thousands of jobs, and reduce about 24 million tons of emissions annually. So this is equivalent of reducing Alberta's annual industrial emissions by 10%. Um, also, the Exerting CCS Technologies, another program that Grace had discussed about, is the international initiative that's focused on accelerating and maturing CO2 cap, uh, CCUS technologies. And so ERA participated as a consortium member uh, for both the Act 3 and Act 4 call, which focused on accelerating the deployment of CCUS technologies in the energy and industrial sectors in Alberta. So today, Alberta Innovates is focused on the next 100 years. So Alberta Innovates aims to help diversify the provincial economy, expand the knowledge workforce, decarbonize the energy sector, facilitate the energy transition, improve the health and well-being, and bring new prosperity by finding new ways of doing things. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Thank you so much. Sana, and thank you for all of the wonderful presentations. Now that we're through the presentations and everybody is busily getting their questions into Slido and upvoting all of their favorite questions that others have asked, I'll kick off the conversation just to get things going. I'm, I'm going to start with a question for Sana because your presentation is the most fresh in my memory. Um, I do know what it's like to be popular at conferences not because of my abundance of dad jokes, but because we at ERA have money to offer as a funding organization. So what I want to ask you, Sana, if it's all right, is, and what I think other people want to know here, is how organizations and entrepreneurs, like you mentioned and referenced, can access funding for both CCUS and hydrogen technology development projects through Alberta Innovates. Yeah, for sure. Can everyone hear me? All right. Okay, so basically the Hydrogen Center of Excellence has their services capacity stream that's right now currently available to take in continuous on a continuous intake basis. Um, we are also um, through Alberta Innovates have the clean technology CCUS and hydrogen portfolio. That's also um, another funding program that we're taking in proposals as well. And then, as I had mentioned about the competition number two, that's coming through the Hydrogen Center of Excellence that we're going to be working with Emissions Reduction Alberta um, to take in proposals, probably launching at the end of 2023 or 2024. Um, so basically, you know, we, you can reach out to um, myself or Dave Van Den Essen, who's one of my colleagues here as well, and he's the director of the Hydrogen Center of Excellence, and we can sort of walk you through the application process, um, and as well as what are some of the options that are available. But when submitting projects through Alberta Innovates, I think the one recommendation that I would definitely have is um, for individuals is to understand their value proposition, um, is to realize what, what innovation does your technology bring to the table? How does it differ from what's already available uh, in the market? And understanding the market analysis, doing performing a market analysis and understanding the commercialization pathway is very important. Um, also looking at what are some of the economic, social, and environmental benefits that your technology brings to Alberta specifically. And the other aspect that we look at when evaluating proposals is um, looking at the project team, the, the partners that are involved, uh, the work plan. And so those are some of the aspects that definitely the criteria that we look at when reviewing these proposals uh, for funding for entrepreneurs specifically or and organizations. Yeah, thanks so much, San. And since you called out Dave Van Den Assem, and he happens to just be standing directly across the room from me. If you don't know Dave, he's the, the tall gentleman straight across the room from me, waving his hand right now. Okay, I'll turn it next over to Chad. Um, and I don't want to give you a softball question. I want to ask you a big question, the big question. And we heard some big numbers being thrown around around the, the scale of capture that's going to be required by 2030, by 2050. What I'm curious, particularly from your perspective at Svante, is how solution providers 
such as yourselves, can possibly scale up to meet the massive volume of projects required in order to meet the world's goals in CCUS? That's a great question, and I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> so we, we Savante, might be a little bit too close. Savante, uh, we, we think the number is around 10,000 plants by 2050, somewhere in that range uh, for, for gigaton plants. Um, that's an enormous amount, uh, EPC procurement, uh, everything required in a project. So we've, we've taken the view that we're gonna take uh, strong partnerships with industry leaders. So for example, if we're doing a project in North America, uh, we're gonna use a North American EPC that knows how to, how to operate. We, we've partnered with Kiwit. Uh, we do a lot of projects with them. Uh, if you're doing something in Europe, we're gonna use Technip Energies, right? A strong partnership, uh, Middle East, um, South Korea, we, we'll use Samsung. Uh, so that, that's, it's really around strong partnerships with us. Uh, we're not going to produce our, our metal organic framework. We're going to use BASF. Uh, they're, they're good at what they do and, and we should utilize uh, the people that, that are really strong and suited for those jobs. Yeah. Thanks very much. That's a really good answer. Okay. Jeff, I think you probably know, hopefully you know exactly what question I'm going to ask. Cause you talked about it yourself. Um, carbon engineering founded here in Calgary, at the University of Calgary. Super excited about your megaton scale project in Texas. However, Texas is not part of Alberta that I know of. Texas, Alberta. And I know, I know very well that the atmosphere doesn't care whether you pull CO2 out of the atmosphere from Texas or from Alberta, um, which is one of the great things about direct air capture and its versatility. But what I want to know is what the future looks like for Alberta, about across, across Canada also, but specifically in Alberta for carbon engineering? That's a good question as well. I think, look, I'll be totally frank with you. If you had someone here from the business development or the marketing group, they'd say, oh, we're ready to act on projects. I'm a physicist by training, so I cannot ignore the fact that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, and we spend a lot of the year in Alberta below zero degrees Celsius. So for a company that's got a liquid scrubbing based technology, it, it's a pretty hard environment to work in. Um, there are other players in the direct air capture space who are working with solid adsorbent desorbents. Some of those work down, you know, into the regime that would let you operate all through the winter um, in Alberta, but then you have plant hardiness issues. Um, it's known publicly that, you know, Climeworks has, Broken Trail, this Climeworks is another direct air capture uh, technology developer. They've broken trail. They've done all sorts of amazing things. They've struggled in Iceland, again, because the weather is tough. So I think, you know, if the world's going to do carbon removal, um, we've got some great ingredients up here, skilled workforce, lots of pore space, cheap energy, land, agriculture. Uh, what we don't have is a favorable climate. So I think if Alberta and Canada want to play a significant role in carbon removal, I think we need to think pretty hard about how to use our, our strengths and overcome our disadvantages, which is a long way of saying, I don't yet know. <laughs> no, that thanks very much. And your comment about freezing water is a perfect segue to James. You talked about the Glacier Project. I, I checked my app earlier. I think it's almost minus 20 in Grand Prairie today, somewhere about there. Um, <laughs> so before you came into our funding challenge, I was not familiar with Entropy. I'm very excited, but I'd love to know what now, so you, you talked about the Glacier Project, you talked about the approach of your company, but maybe could you dive in a little bit deeper and tell us what is next for Entropy in terms of upcoming projects? Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, well, certainly when we first started, we were definitely Alberta focused. And that was a result of the fact that we were small, but we were somewhat well known in Calgary. And we also felt that the regulatory regime in Alberta was more favorable than really anywhere else in the world. This is going back a couple of years. And so we got the glacier plant off the ground and we started into talks with uh, a number of other emitters in Alberta. And uh, many of those projects are, you know, very close to FID, if not at FID. 
but the the landscape has shifted somewhat and uh it's no longer true that we hold i'm speaking of alberta now that lead on the regulatory framework it's no secret uh that many people are looking towards the states they got their act together so to speak very recently and we as well as others are shifting our focus to that so what i would say is that you will see entropy's focus shift uh, to the states at least in part we are involved in some of the hubs and so wherever there would be a major emitter uh, within one of those hubs we'll certainly continue to maintain focus on that project but by and large, uh, the framework that's been realized in the States is going to attract a lot of capital and ours will be no different. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for the, the, the Mark, frank and honest question? answer. I'd like to ask a question of James, if I may. Yeah, of James, I'm curious, you know, because many of the CCS projects get done um, by big emitters, right, that are obligated under Alberta's tier scheme and, and you know, thus basically forego a financial penalty or or having to buy credits from generators. So they almost do a CCS project on their own books, right? The, the economics are all on their own books. You guys are interesting because, you know, like us folks in the carbon removal space, you're a standalone proponent. Um, so you have to make the project economics work and thus you need a revenue stream. So I'm I'm kind of curious um, what you guys see as sort of the best case revenue stream, either here in Alberta or across Canada, and whether that rests on generating and then selling tier credits to obligated parties, generating credits under the clean fuel regulation that will come in federally and, and selling those to obligated parties or something totally different. Well, first I'd start, first of all, we, we do plan to deploy capital on these projects, but that that's by no means the only business model under which we can operate. So we could and, and do entertain uh, licensing models and could going forward. That being said, um, it is true that in Canada, we carry more of a stick than a carrot. And so when we talk about revenue, it's not, I believe you should not just talk about revenue. You have to, I mean, uh, liability avoidance is something that can pay out a project anyway. But in some way, you must have the ability to pay out the capital input, whether it's in a tax avoidance or uh, you know a revenue from sequestering carbon. So what you really need is certainty. And this is where Canada has fallen behind. And so we have goals as to what the carbon price is going to be but we don't have anything any legal framework to support that and so in spite of the fact that we're working on things like that that is inevitably going to re-divert capital and then further to that when i say that a lot of our projects in alberta are not are on hold uh, it's also access to poor space which I believe there was a strategic error made when we stopped approving, or maybe one would say we never did start approving a lot of the anthropogenic CO2 projects under the acid gas framework. We used to talk about how far ahead we were with the acid gas framework, but now that we've re-diverted to a separate process where anthropogenic CO2 is being treated differently, that's really slowing up the process of certainty on the regulatory front. And, and the problem is capital does not wait. Well, you've got some of the right folks in the room to talk to about that here today. I see some smiling right now. Um, okay, th thanks very much. There's, no, I really appreciate the, the frank answer. And, and thanks for jumping in with that fantastic question as well. Paul, you've been very, very patient. Um, and I'm really curious, having built in 2016, what was the world's largest capture plant, um, and now working on an even largest er capture plant uh, coming up in the next couple of years, yep. your team is clearly equipped to deliver mega scale projects. Now, what if we kind of flip that around? What what does 
Mitsubishi heavy industries offer for small CCS plant capabilities that can be easily implemented? Well, if you sign an NDA, I'll talk all about it. <laughs> Not just kidding. Uh, no, Mit oops. Uh, Mitsubishi has uh, an, a suite of uh, five uh, designs that are already pre-engineered, which range from uh, 0.3 ton a day to all the way to 200 ton a day. So 0.3 really is going to be something that you would use as a, as a pilot plant. We're actually delivering one of those units to, to Edmonton in the next little while. Built in Japan and, and will be used by one of our clients here, but they can also be built uh, locally. Um, so yeah, so we have these facilities that are pre-engineered, they're all modularized, they're, they're truckable facilities or for truckable modules. So yeah, we already thought of that and, uh, and we're seeing that there's a, actually a significant interest both in the midstream as well as the upstream facilities. So yeah, we'll be glad to talk about it some more, but <laughs> there's only so much we can, uh, we can get into without, uh, <laughs> Perfect. without getting to NDAs, yeah. Now, notwithstanding the very simple instructions from the AV team about how to switch to Slido, I am not able to figure that out. Uh, John is here to the rescue, but we've got a couple minutes for... Well, there we go. You need to press the magic button that I couldn't find. Okay, we've got time for a couple of questions. I know some of our panelists have a hard stop right at 4 p.m., um, so I'm try and uh, get this done in time, but some really upvoted questions uh, including what is the energy consumption for captured CO2 per ton parasitic energy uh, for each of your technology? Well, so that we could take a long time to go through this, but if we can go across the board, maybe particularly um, those that are comfortable sharing either a range or a, a broad estimate for your flagship technology. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, you're putting me on a spot here. Um, I'm not sure if I can really get, get into it, but uh, it's definitely in 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 yeah in two and a half two and a half range gigajoules per ton. But, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else comfortable? <laughs> uh, so for us, uh, we've been public that our goal is two GJs per ton. And uh, again, we've you can check our press releases. We're we're getting there. We're not quite there yet, but we're just about there. I'm guessing we skip Alberta Innovates. Um, <laughs> so so air capture is a different beast because we're capturing from yeah. the air um, 400 ppm instead of you know uh, 100,000 or or thereabouts. Um, so we're about three times higher than your average point source capture energy demand. Um, we've published a uh, mass and energy balance several years ago now that's a little bit out of date, but points you to about eight or nine gigajoules per ton. Um, that was for our technology specific, specifically, but um, the numbers I've seen for every other direct air capture company, once converted to a common basis, come up in about the same range. So nobody gets a free lunch. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. Okay, so Paul, I, I asked you kind of, oh, sorry. I'd like oh. to answer that. Question. Oh, hey, hey, you know, don't take it personally. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not. Um, so up until about four months ago, uh, we were taking, we were, we were creating steam uh, from ambient conditions. Now we're using waste, waste cooling water. So we, we've drastically reduced the, uh, the amount of energy that we use. So we're depending on the balance of plant, depending on the facility, we're somewhere, we're expecting to be somewhere in the two to two and a half gigajoules per ton. So That's very great. competitive and a simple, elegant solution. Excellent. Great answers. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just follow that up. I mean, I, I guess it's, it's hard to compare. I just want to be clear that when we state that two GJs per ton, I'm sure Mitsubishi should say the same thing. I mean, all of our heat is coming from waste heat at this point. And in fact, we have excess waste heat we give back to the emitter. Yeah, thanks very much. Great, okay. I love that we what three minutes left. I hopefully we'll get through one, maybe two more questions. I already, we already talked about this a little bit with Paul. You feel free to, to, to jump on the question again though, if you like. Um, and this comes up often, I'd say in the nuclear industry where you know, we, we want to talk about sort of a reverse economies of scale and scaling down for a modularity, but there's still, it's really important to talk about whether 
how feasible it is to scale technologies down to a lower scale. So I don't know if you have a minimum tons per day that's feasible, but uh, even a range or throw something out there, whether it's finger in the wind or whatever, what would you say is about the lowest tons per day that you would consider? I, I can start if, if you'd like. Uh, so I think CO2 capture is a volume game. It's, it's important by the time you put in piping and construction and you mobilize everybody that needs to be mobilized. We've pegged that number at around somewhere between three and 400 ton per day. We, we think that's feasible. Uh, it gets an awful lot easier economically when it's bigger, like a 2,000, 3,000 ton a day plant. Uh, but we've we pegged our number at about 300 ton per day. Anyone else? No. Is it on now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I would say that uh, we would go uh, somewhat smaller than that. Uh, you know, our uh, commercial scale plant captures 50 ton a day about there, and we could probably entertain a plant that's more like 25 ton a day, which is, you know, a couple thousand horsepower unit. Wow. Yeah, that's really small. Like I was saying before, look, we, we have that range from 0.3, I think it's 0.3, then 3, 30, 100, and 200. Yeah. So all those are engineered. I think the important thing to understand is, is that when you're, if that's the capacity that you need, that's the capacity that you need. But when you're looking at scaling up and you're looking at just putting in pilots, you you have to consider the the magnitude of, uh, of scale up that you're going to when you're actually going for full scale. So yeah. don't go too small because yeah. there is that concern. But you know, if you're dealing with a license of like MHI, where we have plants from 0.3 all the way to 4,800, then, you know, we will provide that, uh, that know, know how for you. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So. Thanks. Anything quick to add, Jeff? Might not be quick, but um, no, look, Chad said something really important. It's, it's a volume game. Um, we all have a supercomputer in our pocket. Some people even have electricity generation on their roof, but for anything that's mass flow related, we build big. Right. Yeah. We do wastewater treatment big. We do oil refining big. Anything that's got to move big flows of, of mass, we do big. So, you know, more power to anybody out there who's trying to, you know, find the right project niches and do small scale projects to start with. But if we're looking sort of top down society wide at technology strategy, I think you want to manage the carbon problem at the biggest scale possible. Yeah. Thanks. So, yeah, we could build a DAC module to sit on your table, but the economics are going to be horrendous. Our next conference, I want to see one sit on your table. <laughs> well, we used to have one. We gave it away. <laughs> no, I, no, thanks very much. Well, holy carbon capture, we're out of time. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around to the very end. And a big thanks to our panelists for taking the time to share your wisdom with all of us. I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff and to John to close things up for the day. Thank you, everyone.